have our Facebook Live type things. So, um, you know, we want you to be here uh, if you can, but uh, we will continue to do what we have been doing. And um, so we're, we're grateful for the technology um, that we have. I want to say um, thank you to everyone, all of our board members and security and, and the ushers who've just done a fantastic job trying to cover all of the bases that we're trying to cover. It's kind of like nailing jello to a tree sometimes. Um, it, you know, we want to be careful as we can and whatnot, but. Thank you for all of your help, the AV people, the music people, and just we're, we're out of our comfort zone, and so it's a little different, but we're grateful, and so grateful that you're here as well. And we will add um, other ministries as we can. And so like some churches, they're doing a phases. Well, we decided not to do that because we don't know how long a phase is gonna last. So, but uh, the, the promise is as fast as we can, We'll add nursery and Sunday school and PM services and all that stuff. We we're anxious to get back to that. So just want you to know that if you didn't <clears throat> already know, and we're grateful for your patience with us because we know we boogered some stuff up along the way. So thank you for your patience on that. Visitors, thank you for again for being here with us. Please do come back. And, uh, you know, Hunter's Church is a fantastic place to be. Uh, we do things very well here, and it's not because... It's because of the people here are so good at what they do. Uh, we do, I've never seen Iwana's done better. Um, you know, we do a lot of things just so very well. And if you want more than, than what God's given us to give, you, you might want too much, you know. And so I'm very grateful for all the, our folks and all that we do. So please come back and be with us. If you would, turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Um... I was asked actually a couple times very recently what I was going to preach on today. And I think by the church calendar, quote unquote, you know, the, that everybody uses, you're supposed to preach on the ascension. And that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. I'm not necessarily one that follows a church calendar, but I'm not upset if people do, whatever. Um, but. Um, one of the beauties of working through a book is it's amazing how often where you are seems to be in line with what sometimes people expect the preacher to preach on in light of, I don't know, a cultural issue or time of the year or whatever. It happens more than you would think. And so, I, you know, I, I'm, I really believe God is doing that kind of thing. And I rejoice in that. It's pretty cool. So when somebody asked me, you know, what, we, what I was preaching on today, I said, well, going back to Matthew 5. <laughs> well, it happens to be that Matthew 5, 38 through 42 is kind of right in line with what probably a lot of guys are preaching today in their pulpits. So if it's, if it, if it's, a, if it's a more than a coincidence, uh, it, blame it on God. That's his business. And I'm, I'm glad for that. So I hope you are too. Uh, it's been said that uh, God is fair. Well, I'm, I want to tell you God is not fair. If, if God was fair, we'd all be in trouble, right? Uh, one definition of fair is according to the rules. And if God was fair according to the rules, we'd be in trouble. But God is merciful and gracious and kind and patient and loving even when we break the rules. But he can do that. He's got a right to do that. Not just because he's God, but because he's made a way to be that way. And that's through his son, Jesus Christ. So he can be just and merciful at the same time because the price has been paid. So I'm glad God's not fair, aren't you? I'm glad he's merciful and just. We've seen this week, if you have a TV or the internet, you've seen a lot of justice, injustice, however your opinion is. You've, you've heard the terminology go out there, social justice this and justice that and, and whatever. Um, there's a lot of, um, uh, and it seems to be increasing, at least in my life, uh, 
uh, injustices, uh, a lot of incivility, uh, a lot of um, division and disagreement out in the world. The world's getting smaller, you know, through communication and transportation. And so a lot of varying views and opinions are more easily and quickly stated. And so you find yourself at odds or more people at odds quicker that way. And, you know, we're, we're all prejudiced people. You know, you, you, you think what you think is right. You think that your belief is right. If you didn't, you wouldn't hold on to it as a belief. You know, you, you wouldn't contend for your opinion. You would say, okay, yeah, you're right. But whenever we do um, find ourselves in, in, in conflict with other people, then the pressure rises. And we're, and we're emotional beings, so the emotions rise. And then the reasoning starts to kick in. And, you know, it's just because of this or it's right because of that. And somebody says, well, no, that's not right. And, you know, and, and, and we're, we're kind of hypocritical, too. Uh, I'll illustrate it this way. I, I read this illustration in a book I was reading a few months ago about conscience. And these two guys were friends. And, uh, and they were kind of, um, um, you know, they might find themselves on a different political spectrum than we might. Uh, or some of us might. And, uh, and so they were talking about the things they agreed with and disagreed with, and these people are wrong about that, and we're right about that, and what the other. And then one of the guys, the other guy, he said, well, do you drink coffee? And the guy said, oh, yeah, I love coffee. The fellow, other fellow said, oh, man, me too. Great. And he said, the one guy then said to the other one, well, do you drink only fair trade coffee? And the guy said, no, I don't care. I just drink coffee. I don't care where it comes from, fair trade or not fair trade. And the guy who agreed with him on all those other things all of a sudden became the guy's enemy because he didn't drink fair trade coffee like he did. How capricious is that? And can't we find ourselves being the same way sometimes? We're agreement on everything, but then it's something, and it may not even be a fundamental. It may not even be an important matter. And next thing you know, we're at odds with that person because they don't have exactly the same view we do. Well, that can be dangerous and it can be difficult. And sometimes we start then taking it out on other people. There's a sense of self-righteousness and pride there. And that kind of underlies a lot of Jesus' point in Matthew chapter 5 this morning. So if you're in Matthew 5, look with me if you would, beginning in verse 38. Jesus continues with this theme of you have heard, but I say. And he's going back to the Old Testament and oftentimes to the Mosaic law. In verse 30, he says, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Have you ever heard that saying? That's pretty common in our culture. It has been for probably centuries. But. There's a transition. I say to you, now that the authority is about to, to step in, because Jesus is the word. He is the God. He is the great creator. He wrote the law. He's the fulfillment of the law. So whatever you think, here's what I say. Do not resist the one who is evil. That's a key phrase in this text. But we do resist. And that's where the problem comes in. We want to respond and react the way we think it should be done, according to our sense of justice and right. So you cannot divorce this statement from this text. Do not resist the evil, the one who is evil, that person. He's not talking necessarily about Satan. But if anyone, he's going to illustrate it now, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Have you ever even seen somebody do that? Have you ever even heard of somebody doing that other than in here? And if anyone forces you to go a mile, go with him two miles. He's starting to get cultural now because the Romans could force you to bear their burden, their sword, their stuff, whatever, for a mile in this culture. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Now, we typically don't mind giving, but just make sure you give it back. 
right? If you want to borrow my shovel, brother, that's fine. But put it back where you got it in better condition than you found it, right? And if they don't, well, now we're upset over a shovel or whatever the case might be. So we can understand this, can't we? May, we may not understand all the nuances of the culturalization here in these examples, but we understand what it's like to be um, robbed. We understand what it's like to be treated unjustly to some degree or other. We understand what it's like to be humiliated to some degree or other, whether we deserve it or not. But how do we respond to it? And that's what Jesus is dealing with here this morning. Injustice, prejudice, persecutions and the like. Ladies and gentlemen, all of that is a part of being in a broken world. Welcome to the program. It's part of where you live. And it's not going away no matter how much you want it to. Doesn't make it right. It's just not going away. Just like when Jesus said, the poor you have with you always. We would like to end poverty, but Jesus said, you're always going to have the poor. I'm kind of leaning on Jesus' side. We're always going to have the poor. That doesn't mean we can't address poverty there, right? Sure. But is there a right response to being done wrong? I want you to think about that question the whole time. Is there a right response by the Christian when they are done wrong? And you know the answer. Yes, there is. Like God, or in Christ in this case, we too need not focus on being fair, but being merciful, being gracious. Get fair out of your mind. Because especially as Christian people, we will not and we should not expect to be treated fairly. And this goes back to a sermon we preached a few weeks ago, remember, about the cloak and sometimes we want to use our rights as Americans as a cloak to excuse our not responding to things spiritually. We respond spiritually first and foremost because our King says that we do. Our Savior says that we do. Our Lord says that we do. So we're going to talk about that this morning. Father, we do thank you for this hour and I pray that you bless it. I pray that everything we do and say is pleasing to you and that it brings honor and glory to you. May we understand well what you are telling us in this text and may we assimilate it, not in just into our minds, but into our lives so that we act on it, not just compulsory, but because you live in us and you have taught us and your son has illustrated to us how to respond. May our response be humble and genuine. And may that be pleasing to you and may it work your work on earth. And bring honor and glory to you in this life and in eternity. Please. I ask all of this and so much more in Jesus' name. Amen. Years ago, I was talking with a family member, and I, me and this family member have reconciled, everything's good to go, but I don't remember exactly what the issue was, but we were talking about something, and, and I was trying to challenge him and encourage him in his spiritual growth. I was seeing something that just wasn't right, and I don't even honestly remember exactly what it was, but I remember... He said to me, and he said these words, I'll beat you down. Now, <clears throat> Dale Gooding, uh, who thinks of himself as a pretty capable guy physically, wanted to launch in to that guy and say, well, if you feel froggy, jump, brother. <laughs> Ever felt that way? Come on, guys, let's see the hands. I mean, isn't that the mark of a man? I'll, I'll beat you back, brother, and you better bring a lunch because it's going to be a bit. <laughs> right? I mean, that's how we feel. Right now, you can feel your flesh riling up because of a situation like that, can't you? We've been there. We've done it. Wrong. Wrong. That's wrong. That's not how we respond. 
Now, I didn't respond the way I felt like responding. But boy, I wanted to. We all know that feeling. Practicing the truths that Jesus taught us is harder done than said. This is so... This is why this sermon, some of the reasons why the Sermon on the Mount is so wonderful. Because it finds us where we really are and tells us to be where we really should be. And this is one of those places. It makes me not be like me, but be like Jesus and like God wants us to be, doesn't it? And that's a, man, that's a hard mold to form to. But we have an example. And we have a standard here for us. Most practice, most people practice that an injustice deserves another injustice. And yet we all know the old saying, two wrongs don't make a right. Two wrongs don't make a right, especially for us. So many of us, to some degree, practice what we're seeing going on in the big cities of our country right now. We may not go out and do that but we do find some other exercise of our self-righteousness, don't we? We do. So if we're going to condemn that, we have to condemn ourselves too, don't we? They may not be the same thing. They may not be to the same degree, but essentially they're the same. And a lot of it has to do with self-righteousness and pride. Justice. I demand justice. And God demands justice. So let's look at our text and see what we can do about applying it to our lives. Let me give you, first of all, a little bit of a background. If you have Facebook, you can bring up the outline on there. We did not put the outlines out in paper like we usually do through avoiding paper. But the, the outline is on the Facebook, uh, the church public Facebook page. You're welcome to get it there. Just some background for this teaching in verse 38, some of the Old Testament texts. I'm going to just give you three real quick. Um, in Exodus chapter 21, verses 22 through 25, Moses said, When men strive together and hit a pregnant woman so that her children come out, she's apparently very pregnant, but there is no harm, the one who hit her shall surely be fined as the woman's husband shall impose on him and he shall pay as the judgment uh, the judges determine. So you can, we wouldn't do that today, but that was the Mosaic law. In Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 16, we see punishment for false witnesses. If a malicious, verse 16, witness arises to accuse a person of wrongdoing, then both parties of the dispute shall appear before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who are in office in those days. And the judges shall inquire diligently. And if he find the witness is a false witness and has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him as he had meant to do to you, his brother. And you can go on with that text. This is why we, in this country, follow a Judaic Christian, Judeo-Christian model of law. We abide by this to some degree. Then thirdly, in Leviticus chapter 24 and verse 20, uh, beginning in the end of uh, verse 19, if anyone injures his neighbor as he has done it, shall it be done to him fracture for fracture. Here's our text. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, whatever injury he has given, a person shall be given to him. Now you say, well, wait a minute, pastor. Is it Moses saying that we exercise vengeance? No. That's a common misunderstanding about this text. It's not about uh, vengeance. It's about equality and justice. And here's the point. It's about not going over. It's, not, it's about not exacting too much. Because let's face it, if you take a dollar of mine... That deserves me taking two dollars of yours because you shouldn't have done it. We want to go above and beyond equality. We want vengeance. That's the natural man. So the law is put there to keep us from exercising a wrong sense of justice. 
And Jesus is going to take that to a new level for us. Because now it's not about justice. It's about God's justice. And him being the absorber of God's judgment. And we will illustrate that to a world that needs to see it. So we absorb it. And when somebody slaps us on the right side of the face or the one side of the face, we turn to them the other. Demonstrating that justice is not what we're after. What are we after? Mercy and grace. And there is no place for vengeance there. The Lord was very clear. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. We'll talk about that later on in the message. So here we have a little bit of a background for our text. And the purpose is to give some guidelines for abuses. You could take these three texts and reading, you know, a, a um, above and beyond them to, for a fuller context, not just the minutia, but a lot of different examples of situations that were dealt with. One of the problems was people started, instead of um, looking to get the eye, they would say, well, I will what we think of as sue you for the, the recompense. So now it became a monetary game. Instead of I don't want your, your, your cow. I want $100. Because the, the man could impose a fine as he saw fit. Uh, we have litigation in the United States. And you can sue somebody for just about anything. And you don't think lawyers are out there trying to get all they can, do you? If you're a lawyer, I love you. If you're a lawyer, I love you. And then, but let's face it, that's the world we live in, isn't it? I mean, come on. You spilled a cup of coffee in your lap, which you know coffee's hot, and you're going to sue McDonald's for a million dollars? Come on. It's not, it's not about the hot coffee. You see what I'm saying? We could go on and on, right? That's what the law was intended to prevent from happening. So in order to make his point, Jesus elaborates on this text in verse 38 and gives some illustrations. I want to break this down... Roman numeral two here into four S's, okay? In verse, beginning in verse 39, and I won't reread the text, Jesus says essentially four things. Number one, resist not. That, that, let me, the, the idea of resist not means to, 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 to not, um, um, don't oppose them. Submit. Give in. Except, if they hit you unjustly, let them hit the other side. If somebody takes something of yours that's not theirs, offer them something else. You say, well, that, that's foolish. No, that's gracious. That's merciful. You're sending them a message. Look, if you need my shirt, here, you need my undershirt too. And for a person to give up their cloak in this case was oftentimes giving up, the, your, think of it as your sleeping bag. Because your cloak, is, it, it, it covered over your undergarment and you slept in it. So now you're giving this guy your bed. I remember years ago, I was doing something at a, at a, at a, at a, um, a gas station. And I can't remember why, but some guy was upset with me about something. He felt like I did him wrong or something, I don't know. And... And then, and I told him, I said, hey, friend, I'm sorry. Listen, I, I pastor First Baptist Church of Prosperity. I didn't mean any, you know, whatever. And his anger doubled. Well, well you know why his anger doubled? Because I just, and I wasn't trying to play the preacher card, but I just told him I pastored a local church. And now he was mad because he felt like he was, he knew he was doing wrong to the preacher. You know how people do about that, right? Oh, I didn't mean to cuss in front of you, preacher. So now he's mad at himself. That's good. That's what we want. We want people to see that mercy and grace scream to them. Isn't that what Christ does in his mercy and his grace? It screams to us love, not justice or vengeance. 
So Jesus says, if someone smites you on the one side, turn to them the other side. Well, if they smite you with the same hand, if they hit you with the open hand this way, and then you offer the other cheek, and they use the same hand, this time it's going to be worse. Why? You got bones on this side, right? But it wasn't just about the pain. It was about the humility in the culture, both Hebrew and same thing for the Jews in the New Testament. So to smack somebody wasn't about just bringing them pain. It was humility. Well, the opposite of humility is what? Pride. You humiliate me, and now you've damaged my pride. Is pride a problem? Pride's a problem. I have a very big pride problem. And you may too. So the primary issue again at hand there was with the slapping was humility. Very serious in their culture. Secondly was the suing. Taking money. Um, the clothing, like I said, you, you, you may want the one thing, but you offer them even more and you again are speaking loudly to them. But this doesn't speak, the suing doesn't speak necessarily to the humility, but to the honesty or the dishonesty. You, you, you are doing an unjust thing. Here, I'll give you more. I remember one of my favorite movies, and I'm not a musical person, is Les Miserables. And um, in Les Miserables, long story short, uh, I think it's Jean Valjean, uh, he's a criminal, and he's got this yellow slip, he'll always be a criminal, and he finds refuge in this Catholic church. The priest is very gracious and kind to him, but he knows that he's always going to have this yellow card. He's just never going to be able to be a citizen again well. So he needs to make money, so he steals the silver from the church. Well, before long, he's, he's caught. The French policemen catch him, and they bring him back to the monastery, and, and they, they say, hey, we found this guy, and you know, he's, he's, he, he took your stuff. And the priest, now he lied, so I'm not not justifying that, but the priest said, oh, did you, did you forget these also? Did, did you forget the best stuff? Here, I gave, these, I gave him these two. He was being gracious and merciful to a thief who stole from the Lord's house. That, that compounds, that puts ashes on the head. It compounds the humility the dishonesty. It speaks love. Isn't that what Christ did? Don't we see that in Jesus? As a lamb led to the slaughter. And thirdly, servitude. If someone, a Roman soldier in this cultural case would be, says to go a mile, take my stuff for a mile, you, you say, oh, okay, I'll go too. Now, can you see the immediate benefit of carrying a Roman soldier's stuff for two miles? If you know Jesus, do you think you might have an opportunity to talk to him? You think if you're going to do the second mile, he might give you an ear if you talk to him? Now, how valuable is a second mile walking with a Roman soldier if you have the opportunity to share love with him? Isn't that valuable? Ministry is costly. But there are opportunities out there for us to take them when we simply do what Jesus tells us to do. They're valuable and they're there. So Jesus says, look, if he's going to ask for a mile, you give him two. And I would say take advantage of the opportunity. Matthew chapter 27, verse 32, we see this exemplified. As they went out, they found a certain man, a Cyrene, Simon by name, they compelled this man to carry the cross. And many people believe that he's mentioned later on and that he was a Christian. This man was compelled to carry the cross. We shouldn't be compelled to. We're already compelled to. We should desire carrying the cross. Remember what the Lord said to the rich young ruler? And he said, I have done all these things. Jesus said, Sell all that you have and come and follow me. And the man turned away because he's very sad for he had great riches. And Jesus condemned that. That this man would not 
take up his cross and follow Christ, he didn't feel compelled to. We should feel compelled to. Then fourthly in that section is on supplications, begging and borrowing. And this is dealing with benevolence and mercy. I remember, I'll illustrate it this way. I remember years ago, this lady who was coming to our church and she was kind of in now and uh, kind of bothered me. Um, but I led her to the Lord and she still was kind of in and out. And I remember one time her son, who was just not an outstanding guy, he um, had a flat tire and it was just irreparable. So I said, no problem. Just, you know, I had some cash birthday money or something in my, in, in my pocket. And I said, you'll go up here and we'll get you a tire. We did. And he said, man, hey, pastor, I'll, I'll pay you back. I promise. Blah, 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 blah. Well, that was a long time ago. <laughs> I still haven't seen that 70 bucks. Do you see what I just said? Now, this was, all of this was running through my mind at the time. But I still wanted my 70 bucks. I'm not there yet. I still feel it. Don't you? I did the right thing, but I haven't arrived yet. But I still did the right thing. But if the guy ever <laughs> sends me a check for 70 bucks, I'll be happy to sign it and take that money. <laughs> I'm such a bad Christian, it's not even funny. <laughs> so Jesus elaborates on the heart of the law here both in not being excessive and by illustrating God's grace and mercy. So the question for us is, how do we face in situ how do we respond in situations like this? So what's the purpose here? The, the number one, we see in this Jesus conduct. He is both teaching us and we'll watch him do this as we watch as we walk through the New Testament. He is going to do what he's telling us to do. He's going to be what he's calling us to be. Jesus is the perfect man and illustrates this teaching. Again, as a lamb led to the slaughter, he opens not his mouth. You have to remember here, the most unjust thing that ever happened in all of eternity was when sinful, wicked men took the Son of Man the Lamb of God, and put him on a cross unjustly, beat him, humiliated him, and killed him. You cannot find a more egregious thing in all of eternity. And Jesus took it. He absorbed it. And we like to think we would have done that. Mm, not so fast. We're having a hard time with this. Hey, that's me. That's cool. <laughs> Time warp. <laughs> we all do it. Simply put, Jesus is giving a command. This is an imperative for us. This, this isn't just for the good Christians. This is for Christians. This is for all people. And Jesus isn't usurping the Old Testament and doing this because the Old Testament was not about vengeance. In Luke chapter, excuse me, Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18, Moses says, You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people. So remember, like we said earlier, it wasn't about vengeance, it was about just reciprocating. You know, you killed my cow, give me a cow. That's all. Not two cows, not ten cows. Just give me a cow. The Old Testament taught justice and payment, not vengeance. And we'll see that, and not in this paragraph, but in our next paragraph, because in verse 43, right after this, Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your enemy, and uh, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemy. That's what follows this text. And you understand that. So let's make some observations according to this text. He doesn't say, let the evil abuse you. So don't think on that line, because that's not what's happening here. If we're guilty, we should pay. If you commit a crime 
and the, 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 the payment is whatever it is, and, and for justice sake, you owe that, and you should pay that. Don't feel like because you're a Christian, you're above that, because you're not. You're not above the law. We're not. Secondly, if we're humiliated, respond with humility. It, it preaches the cross when we do that. Thirdly, we are subject to people. We are in this world, and the Bible's very clear, we are subject to the authorities that be. Romans 13, verses 1 through 3. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. Now, when, when, and we talked about this too, whenever they go too far, then we respond rightly. We obey God rather than man, Acts chapter 5, remember? But until then, we are subject. And fourthly, when we are needed, help out. It, 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 we only show good when we help our neighbor. For, I'll, I'll illustrate this for you. Hunter's Creek has not not had services because the government said you cannot have services. That's not why we've done it. Because we could have had services. We did it for two primary reasons. Number one, we didn't know how bad this was. We wanted to make sure our people didn't get sick. We, we wanted to be mindful of that. Number two, we wanted to be a good testimony to our, our community. If somebody had gotten sick, eh, those people, they cause Hunter's Creek, you know, like the churches down south and whatever, they're doing it because they can and they're making a big name for themselves, but for the wrong reason. We decided not to have services so we could love each other and we could love our neighbor. We're not keeping a mandate. We're just loving our neighbor. Does that make sense? We're doing good for good's sake. And we have the ability to do all these things online. It's not like we've really missed that much. We've missed the intimacy. We've missed the familiarity. But we can catch up with that. We'll, we're going to eat. We're going to hug. We're going to kiss. We're going to shake hands. We're going to do that. But in the meantime, we're going to love our neighbor. And we're going to try to help them flatten the curve if that's what needs to be done. But what we will not do is let them tell us what to do contrary to the Word of God. That's when we will do what we have to do. But no more than we have to do. And we will try to do the best we can in love. So let's do good if we can. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 17, it's a little bit of a text. Peter says, finally, all of you have unity in mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil. Remember, this was Peter who was likely at Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount. Walked with Jesus this whole time, and this is well after Jesus had been crucified, resurrected, and ascended. He's now teaching this as a pastor, as an apostle. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you are called, and that's why I'm saying to that we are called, that you may obtain a blessing for whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. The Lord is for us even if we pay an unjust price. And they will get what's coming to them. You don't have to give it. But what if you demonstrate this grace, this mercy, this patience, and this love, and it speaks to them, and they want to know more about it, and you share Christ with them? Don't we want that? Yes. Yes, it's what we do. It's why we do what we do. So let's apply some of this. Number one. 
As ambassadors and emulators of Jesus, we speak or preach most clearly and loudly when we say and when we do what Jesus taught us and showed us. When we keep his commandments and we follow his example, the world sees to a degree Jesus in us. Just like, the, like think about the centurion who said, surely this man was the son of God. He saw and he heard. What a great opportunity we have when we're done wrong, being done wrong. Secondly, in order to follow these teachings, we have to deny ourselves. In Mark chapter 8, verse 34, in coming, calling the crowd to him with his disciples, Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. Let me say it again. Deny himself. Let me say it again. Deny yourself and take up the cross and follow Christ. Not just in his, you know, behind him, but in his words and in his deeds. He is the example. So number one, we want vengeance. Paul quoted in Hebrew, excuse me, in Romans chapter 12, verse 19, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. We like having our own way. Number two, Proverbs chapter nine, verse 17 says, stolen waters are sweet, but bread eaten in secret is pleasant. That's how we do things. Well, nobody will see what I do. Nobody will say what, hear what I say. I'm gonna get my way though. We like getting away with wrong. And thirdly, we don't like being humiliated. It's part of our core nature. Matthew chapter 23 and verse 12, whoever exalts himself will be humbled and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. We'll let Christ do the exalting. How about that? Amen? Even if you have to pay for it. We don't like to be subject, but we must be subject. James chapter 4 verse 7 James is clear, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. We're, 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 in honoring this text, we are submitting ourselves to God. That's a hard thing to do. What do we lose when we disobey these things? Let me give you a few things. Number one, we lose our faithfulness to the Lord, our obedience to him, our subjectivity to him. He may be putting you in a position to do a great thing, with your humility. Number two, we replace God's justice with our substandard justice. God wants to exact a right justice for that crime or that punishment or whatever to that person. But we want to do it our way. God's justice will be better than yours because he knows the whole situation. He knows what's going to work in that person. Thirdly, we miss the opportunity to do kingdom business. For example, going that second mile with that Roman soldier and sharing the gospel with him while you're doing it. Fourthly, we lose the opportunity to show humility and the love of Jesus. I just want you to, in your mind, think about Jesus being beaten, being reviled, willingly going to the cross and dying for your sin. He who knew no sin became sin for us and went through all that and in a moment, he could have called down 12 legions of angels and fixed everything, made it right. I would have done that. You would have done that probably too, wouldn't you? Because it's unfair. It's not right. And then fourthly, we demonstrate our, or fifthly, we demonstrate our hypocrisy. The reality is we've probably done worse to others than most people have ever done to us. Amen. At least, in, at least sometimes, yeah. Second to that demonstration of hypocrisy, and this is the standard, we forget, and this is paramount, that we have done God infinitely more wrong than any man has ever done to us. Therefore, if God forgives us for Christ's sake, through his blood, having known that forgiveness, how can we not forgive someone else who has come nowhere near as close to an injustice towards us as we have towards God? The precedent, the example, 
is illustrated before us, and now we're being told to be like that way. There's an explicit teaching here. Now, maybe you're here today and you're an unconverted person. By that, I mean you're not saved. If you died today, you would not go to heaven. Not because you don't believe in God, not because you're not a good person or whatever, but you simply have not trusted Jesus to be the payment for your sin. Well, this is what this text is screaming. Jesus was done unjustly because you have done unjustly. And he took your injustice so you would not have to pay for that injustice. And the only way to have that payment applied to your account is to receive the injustice he paid for. We call it trusting Jesus as Savior, asking him to save you, calling on the name of the Lord. The reality is you've done wrong. He paid the price for your wrong. Somebody's got to pay it. Either he does or you do. If you don't let him do it, you've got to do it. So for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, and the idea of calling out to the name of the Lord is God save me. I'm in this wilderness I am in this ocean, and I'm about to sink and die. Deliver me. Throw me the life raft of Jesus and save me. You say, I don't fully understand that. I got it. Let's talk. I'd be happy to talk to you about it. But if you feel, you know that something's moving in your soul right now. Yes, that thing that you can't really explain, but you're feeling it. That may very well be God moving on your heart to draw you to himself, to save you, to deliver you from the penalty of your sin. You had best act on it because that's the very God of eternity talking to you. You say, we have a tendency to say, I can do this. Well, you can't do it. I want to leave you with one last long text. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. We're about done. This is Peter again. Verse 18. Servants, be subject to your own masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing. When... Mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if, in other words, you deserved it. But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Watch this last verse. Ladies and gentlemen, it's what I've said several times this morning. For to this, you and I have been called. Ladies and gentlemen, to be a Christian is to suffer for Christ. Jesus was very clear about that in his earthly ministry. They hated me. They're going to hate you. Welcome to the family. That's what you get for being in this crowd. And that's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. If we want justice, let's direct people to the justice of Christ. That changes people. Breaking stuff, vengeance, getting even, that doesn't change people's hearts. At best, it just makes things equal. At best. We're not about making things just equal. We're about more than equal. We're about mercy. We're about getting what you don't deserve positively. Some of us carry guns. We're CWP. I don't think you call it that in Michigan. Concealed weapons permit holders. Some of us. And sometimes we kind of let that go to our head a little bit, don't we? we I'm ready to pull the trigger, brother. You mess with me, I'll put you down. Well, most CWP holders know that you don't pull that trigger, not only because it's going to ruin your life, because it is, even if you're right, but you got to ask yourself, what's that life worth? Wouldn't it be much better to pull out your New Testament <laughs> instead of pulling the trigger unless you have to? Amen. Yeah. That, that ought to be our mindset. I'll close with this.
Proverbs 20, 22. Do not say, I will repay evil. Wait for the Lord. He will deliver you. So brother and sister, wait for the Lord. Emulate Jesus. Follow this teaching. Humble yourself. Submit yourself. Look for that opportunity to be Jesus and to share Jesus with the world that does not like you. You may not like them, but God loves them. And this is whereunto we are called. Father, thank you for your word. May we, as difficult as it is, and denying the resistance in us to do our own thing, to mete out justice as we see it need be met, may we not. May we humble ourselves, may we submit ourselves, and only act with force, only reciprocate when we really have to. But let us follow Christ's example as a lamb led to the slaughter. Let us be the lambs Jesus told us we would be in wolves because they're out there. And we ask that you honor our submission, that you draw men to yourself because of the grace and the humility that is displayed in obedience to Christ in this text. And if there's anybody here who is unconverted, unconverted Father, I pray that you'll save them today, right now. I ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Folks, thank you for very much for being with us here today. I'm going to ask if we've got some ushers back there in the back, if you would come and think of yourself as being at a, a wedding and releasing people or funeral, releasing people by rows. If you would just let people, you know, kind of know. If you would, folks, follow the example of these, these men as they're trying to just get, guide you out. Please remember, don't bottleneck the foyer there. Foyer folks, y'all can probably just go ahead and, uh, you know, run out. <laughs> and uh, don't forget that the offering uh, plates are right there out at the doors going out. Thank you for being here today. Lord bless you. Have a wonderful day. See you next week. Bye-bye. Five minutes to do who? Five minutes to empty the narthex.